Uh, my name is Ahmad Harb. I am the Director of Research and Analysis at uh, Arab Center, Washington, D.C. Uh, today, uh, you know, the Arab world is going through some really wrenching times, uh, times of change, times of conflict. Uh, but uh, in, in a way, uh, these conflicts are, uh, yes, they are the, uh, the creation of, you know, present conditions, but they also are uh, a resultant uh, uh, of, uh, you know, it's uh, the Arab world's uh, history and uh, development. Um, with us today is uh, Elizabeth Thompson. Uh, she's a, uh, a professor of history at uh, American University, and uh, she is the author of uh, uh, the book How the West Stole Democracy, uh, the, the Syrian Arab Congress of 1920 and the Destruction of its Historic Liberal Islamic Alliance. Uh, <laughs> A big title uh, for a very, very important, uh, uh, important book. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Dr. Thompson is, uh, as I said, is a professor of history at American University. She is the chair of the uh, Mohammed Persi uh, Chair of Islamic uh, uh, Peace at uh, American University. Uh, she is a historian of political movements, constitutionalism, gender, and foreign intervention in the Middle East. She is also the author of two other books. Uh, Justice Interrupted, The Struggle for a Constitutional Government in the Middle East uh, from Harvard University Press in 2013, and Colonial Citizens, uh, Republican Rights, Paternal Privilege, and Gender in French Syria and Lebanon from Columbia University Press in 2000. Uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, good morning. This is your, your book, and uh, your book is really chock full of details. Uh, it's a, it's a, a very, very comprehensive look at uh, uh, the development of uh, uh, the basically the Arab Levant, uh, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean countries, today's countries of Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Palestine, Israel, and Jordan as well as uh, partly uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and this book covers uh, the period when uh, uh, basically the uh, forces that uh, emerged from the Arabian Peninsula uh, to uh, end uh, the Ottoman Empire's control of the area uh, and uh, forged north uh, to uh, control Syria and their attempt to um, uh, basically establish uh, an Arab independent uh, uh, Syrian uh, kingdom. Uh, I think uh, in uh, many places, it's uh, some some people called it the United States of uh, of Syria, uh, or uh, or the United Kingdoms of Syria. Anyway, uh, and uh, you know, uh, this was the the, the, the origin was uh, to establish some sort of a constitutional uh, monarchy. Uh, and uh, Prince Faisal uh, of um, uh, the, the son of Sharif Hussein, uh, the king of Hijaz at the time, uh, had led the Arab forces into Syria and uh, helped uh, establish such a, such a state, although that establishment was really very, very short-lived and uh, it ended uh, almost immediately after it was announced. Um, uh, I, I just, I just thought that uh, we, we just uh, concentrate on some things instead of uh, the details uh, of it, um, uh, but you know, this is this is a an idea uh, uh, that emerged from the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in World War One. Now uh, the uh, you know Arabs at the time decided that maybe this is the time to really rid ourselves of occupation and colonialism in the form of the Ottoman Empire and establish ourselves as an independent nation in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, obviously, the European powers were not necessarily very, very happy about it. Uh, they, they had always spoiled to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, take over the sick man of Europe that the Ottoman Empire used to be called. Uh, but they never really went ahead and uh, destroyed the Ottoman Empire until World War I. Mm -hmm. Now, why did the European not want Eastern, the Eastern Mediterranean region to be independent? <laughs> Well, the simplest and I think the truest, simplest and most profound reason is that Britain needed the oil in Iraq. I'm sorry to say it. Right. It's a kind of cliche since the Gulf War that uh, that's the real reason the West goes to war in the region. But uh, as many sources as I combed through over the period of about six years, always came back to that motive. 
right, that um, they had fought, a, they had converted their Navy to petroleum in 1911. They had run short of oil during the war, as did France. And so after the war, uh, they wanted to occupy Mesopotamia, as they called it, okay. in order to gain their very own oil fields, all right, that they would have sovereignty over. Uh, second, of course, uh, as uh, time went on, uh, they became very concerned that the more advanced Arabs, meaning Arabs who were able to, clearly able to rule themselves and to build a modern democratic style government, would um, inspire Arabs already under colonization in North Africa and Muslims in India to demand independence from the colonial empires that both the British and the French rule. So those are the two reasons. Yeah, uh, yeah well, there, there were other, other things as well, right? I mean, we, uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, the Sykes-Picot Agreement was already signed in, 20, in uh, 1916. Uh, the Balfour Declaration in November of, 20, of 1917 uh, so, uh, uh, how much did these have, how much influence did these two agreements, so to speak, uh, have on the ultimate aim of uh, helping, uh, of, of, of not helping uh, this independent state to come through? The Ottomans? The Ottomans had no interest in seeing independent Arabs. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not, not the Ottomans. I mean, the, 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 the two agreements, the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the Balfour Declaration, how prominent were they in British and French uh, plans not to allow the Syrians to really have an independent state? Yes, there's a whole game. The, um, the uh, Paris Peace Conference, which began in January 1919, Correct. has been described as a laboratory of fabricating a new world order based on international law, thanks right. to Woodrow Wilson and his 14 points and so on. And the British and the French used the Balfour Declaration and the Sykes-Picot Accord as cornerstones of that law, that right. uh, you could not go back on them. If we're going to have a world based on law, we cannot go back on our treaties, right? Uh, so that put the Arabs in a box and they had to argue against that notion of a kind of unilateral or bilateral, if you will, uh, organizing of the world through uh, treaties amongst the great powers on behalf of or against the will of third parties, colonial Correct. people, right? right. Um, Woodrow right. Wilson, interestingly, as bad as his reputation is in the United States for his racial segregation in Washington, D.C., and so on, right. understood that um, and fought it. The thing that astonished me most in writing the book is that Wilson engaged in his most bitter fights at the Paris Peace Conference, aside from fights on Germany and rep reparations right. about Syria. Syria was the most contested issue because that was the cornerstone of his vision to see a world built on international law through the participation of the peoples involved, what he called self-determination, right? So he even right. sent an American delegation out to Syria to have it collect Syrians' views of how they wanted to be governed after the war. Right. That's the, uh, the uh, King Crane uh, Commission. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And, and the King Crane Commission came back with a report that uh, uh, I, I don't think anybody really read uh, because uh, of uh, domestic conditions in the United States, right. uh, that uh, whatever their findings were, nobody really knew about them, right? This was a uh, delegation ultimately sent on the authority of Woodrow Wilson. And right. King and Crane uh, felt bound to keep it secret until the day that Woodrow Wilson would authorize its publication. Right. But Wilson had a stroke at the end of September 1919. Correct. And so the US Congress proceeded to vote on the Versailles Treaty and choose, chose not to join the League of Nations without ever seeing this report to the benefit of the British and French, who just of put course. their copies of the report in a drawer and locked under lock and key. Right, yeah. 
Um, uh, I want to go back a little bit, uh, backwards a little bit, uh, a few years back. Uh, I mean, uh, the Sharif Hussein had, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, honesty. I mean, uh, he's, he's from the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, uh, what really prompted this push to think of himself or his son, for that matter, being the ruler of Syria, uh, considering that, uh, you know, uh, 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 in, in, in the Hejaz, he was really fighting Ibn Saud. He was really fighting for his uh, control of his own area. I mean, uh, uh, was that was that really a, a uh, just simply the British really cheated him to to start to help them to uh, to kick the Ottomans out of the Arabian Peninsula and of Syria, and promised him just promised him that, or was there really a deeper uh, uh, you know relation that Sharif Hussein could claim to Syria? Uh. His relationship to Syria was really through the person of Faisal, his son. Right. Um, and uh, I think if you look at the date that the Arab Revolt began in, in June of 1916, right. it uh, followed a year of negotiations with the British that had begun in the fall of 1915, all right, before Sykes and Pico drew up their accord, right? right? But was prompted the Hussein, the Hussein by reports. McMahon correspondence, right? Yes, it was prompted, and in, in, uh, in as far as we can tell, in the sources that survive, his his interest in contacting the British High Commissioner Commissioner in Cairo about right. um, you know uh, cooperation with a revolt against the Ottomans um, and seeking an, Ara an independent Arab state um, out of that came from reports of the ways in which the Turkish military dicta dictatorship was treating Arabs in Syria. Um, and um, I, I have come to, there's a, there are long debates about this period. And in my study, I've come to side with those who uh, believe that at the beginning, there were strong ties to a group in Syria called Fatat, right? Right. A, a yeah. nationalist group, and that Faisal had joined that group in his visits to Damascus, um, and that the revolt was supposed to first conceived to be a popular revolt uniting Arabs living north in Syria with Arabs in this Arabian Peninsula. But the, um, the Turks broke into the French embassy and found documents and hanged many of the leaders of Fatah who would right, have yeah. led that revolt. And right, so yeah, right. it, the, 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 the modality of the revolt shifted to look like it was a Bedouin tribal revolt of the old fashioned kind against right. the Ottoman Sultan. Uh, but those, I found those, those who survived the executions of 1915 and 1916 re actually remained in contact with Sharif Hussein and his sons and had prepared for the day that the revolt would enter Damascus in victory. So. But, yeah, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, what, what the Ottomans did to the, uh, uh, to the Lebanese and Syrians was uh, unconscionable. Uh, just what they did to the Armenians as well uh, was also unconscionable. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I'd like to also touch a little bit, uh, you, you have um, um, bits and pieces here and there on uh, Ibn Saud and uh, how Ibn Saud, uh, Saud was actually the, he was the existential threat to Sharif Hussein in Hejaz. Uh, Ibn Saud was expanding and, uh, but yet at the same time, the British were dealing with both at the same time. The British, uh, the, the office in, in India was dealing with Ibn Saud and the office in, in Cairo was dealing with Sharif Hussein. Uh, uh, I mean, what was, what, were they in cahoots? I mean, the two offices were in cahoots. They knew what they, what, what they were doing, or were, was each one of them trying to find a foothold, so to speak, an influence on one uh, party or the other in Saudi Arabia? Well, I, I, uh, I find no reason not to, uh, dis, uh, no reason to disagree with the findings of David Frompkin in his book, A Peace to End All Peace, published right. a couple 
you know, what, 30 years ago now? Yeah. Right, yeah. that uh, there was a, a rivalry within the British ad Imperial administration, a rivalry between the Foreign Office and the India Office, uh, yeah. right? Uh, and that uh, there was not a rational plan. Uh, right. There were ambitious uh, uh, British officials on both sides right. uh, seeking to advance their control over the territories liberated from the Ottoman Empire. So the India office wanted to expand through Iraq into right. the Gulf area and yeah. so on. Um, and then those in Cairo, of course, uh, had their own interests uh, to pursue. So um, I don't see a conspiracy to orchestrate that rivalry. Sharif Hussein was not a good ruler in his own, in the Hejaz, he was not well liked. Right. Uh, Ibn Saud was able to draw a much more loyal um, following than he. Um, right. And so it is, you know, we, we can't talk about counterfactuals in history, but it, uh, it uh, could have been predicted that in the right. end, Sharif Hussein would be defeated, right. regardless uh, of what the British did. You know, with the 2020 hindsight, uh, you, you uh, uh, in, uh, in, you know, the, the success of uh, Ibn Saud, uh, uh, the rise of Ibn Saud, obviously, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was ominous. And uh, he really was able to get all those tribes behind him and uh, really push for, uh, for pr primacy. Uh, also, well, you know, with the, uh, with the you know, with 2020 hindsight, you know, you think that, you know, it's only like 20, 30 years later, the Ottoman Empire, the, uh, the British Empire ceased, ceased to exist. I mean, yeah. and uh, they did what they did in the Eastern Mediterranean, and then they were gone. Uh, it's, it's really very, very interesting. Um, I wanted to just touch a little bit uh, also on uh, the issue of uh, uh, the mandates themselves. Okay. Now, the, the, the British and the French also, were, they were rivals, obviously, and the French really resented that the British would uh, even, uh, you know, uh, uh, impinge on their supposed right to really be in Syria and uh, today's Syria and Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and they, they really fought each other uh, a lot uh, on, uh, about this. Uh, but, uh, you know, t tell me a little more about the involvement of the uh, Lebanese Christians, uh, specifically Patriarch Hwayik, uh, and the establishment of a mandated area of indep independent Lebanon that by 1926 was actually in, uh, 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 the Republic of Lebanon was established as a Republic of Lebanon. Um, the, role of, in, in the role of the Lebanese Christians in the final settlement of... Uh, of Precisely, yeah. I mean, you know, pushing for the mandate and later on really affirming it and uh, keeping it going. Right. You know, the, uh, the Maronite Church had been frustrated after 1860. It was denied control over Mount Lebanon, right. um, but it remained very close to the French and um, uh, a partner with the French um, and was able to use the fact that the French did not come to the rescue of hundreds of thousands of Lebanese who died of famine and disease during the war right. um, to make claims on the French. Uh, in that way. I don't know that they would have been successful except for the fact that um, the, uh, the British ambitions, you know, the British wanted Syria too. Lord Curzon really did not want to give up Syria, right? right? And had their ambitions not been so persistent and so broad and, and continually, they were expanding their uh, ambitions in the region through the whole process of the Paris Peace Accords, I'm not sure. You know, I, I don't think um, the the proclamation of a greater Syria, uh, greater Lebanon, separate from Syria, in 1920 would necessarily have occurred. Right? The Prime Minister right. of France was uh, a secular, anti-clerical, anti-colonial. Right. It's a it's a yeah. great paradox and tragedy of history. Right. Um, that he couldn't, he, that he could not rein in the colonial lobby in France. Uh, he had no interest, really, in colonizing uh, Lebanon and Syria. He was interested in a portion of the oil in Mosul, 
sure, right. <laughs> for Mosul, yeah. but, yeah. Um, but it was the pressure of the British that gave leverage to the colonial lobby, which was very close to the Maronite church in Lebanon. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. So there's a whole chain of causality there. Um, and uh, without the partnership of the Maronite church, I don't know that the French could have stabilized their rule in the region. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, it's, the, you know, the, the, it, it, it was really the interesting, uh, the, you know, Faisal is, is such a pivotal figure, yeah. but yet, you know, when, when you look at his history between 1920 and 1932, mm. uh, you know, you feel like he wasn't so pivotal after all because he was cheated all the time. It's almost like he believed the wrong people all the time, and he, he almost like wishful thinking that, yes, things are going to happen this way. Uh, why was he so institutionally and, and uh, basically, you know, he was liked, but I don't think he was really truly loved, that loved by uh, everybody. So, you know, what, what, why, was, why was he such a failure? Hmm. You know, he's been considered a failure um, by people who look backwards from the present back to the past. Uh, why wasn't he um, like Mustafa Kemal Ataturk? Right, exactly, who yeah, right. Kicked the Europeans out of Turkey, right? Correct. Well, that's easy. He didn't have an army. He didn't he have did weapons, not. right? The yeah. British and the French were in occupation of the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. Right. Mustafa Kemal was able to organize an army in areas of Anatolia where the Allies had not landed. That's and correct. he happened to have a spare army up on the Russian border. So right. that doesn't go to person, you know, Faisal's personal personality or any personal flaws. He was dealing with a very difficult situation, right? right. The yeah. question was, could you use the legal process set in motion at Paris to the advantage of the Arabs um, through a politics of what I came to understand really is more analogous to what Gandhi was trying to do in India of non-cooperation. Right. You right. know, and a good number of the uh, veterans of the Syrian Arab Congress in 1920 would return to Palestine and practice exactly a Gandhian non-cooperation right. against the British mandate, right? right, right, um, right so you had a choice right. to do that or a choice to go to Paris and try to negotiate, right? And that's the right. choice that Faisal made. He actually, you know, in, in retrospect, there are historians who defend his deal with Clemenceau in January of 1920 as right. the best possible deal given the circumstances that you could make, right? Um, right. But uh, there were those on the ground who were, you know, favored the other approach of non-cooperation. So right. um, they have written, they were the more educated people in Syria. They had a bone to pick and they were very bitter. And we have re received a history that scapegoated the personality of Faisal and has, did not really look at the larger structural political problem that a, 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 you know, a people without a strong army at a time when really it was guns who created states still, it was not laws. Like you can even That's look right. in Europe. How did yeah. the Poles get Poland? They had an army, right? right. How did yeah, Czech yeah, yeah. Czechs get Czechoslovakia? And, right. you know, so that was the question really for Faisal. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and, and you're, I mean, uh, there, there, was, there was a state declared, uh, they wrote a constitution and they really wanted to establish a, uh, a constitutional monarchy. Uh, how real was that, do you think? Oh, was was Faisal going to allow it to be a constitutional monarchy? Who would allow it? Faisal. Ah, he was defeated. You know, the story of his confrontation with Rashid Ridda right. became president of the Congress. Right. It's famous. People recite that story, right? right. Uh, they confront one another. Faisal says, okay, we have declared independence. No need for this Congress anymore. I will take over. He wanted right. unilateral control over foreign policy and the ability to negotiate with Europeans on his own terms. He right. didn't want 
the, uh, the Trump, as many an absolute ruler uh, today would not want the bother of right. a, uh, a, a legislature, right? And it's Rinda who said, no, you are an elected king. We elected you. You are responsible to us. You are not, right. you know, the old fashioned dynastic sort of king, you know? Right. Um, and so we have to look to that moment and recognize that Faisal lost, right? The, he he right. became the creature of the king and the, you know, the devil in the detail is he wavered as we move into the summer of 1920. And he thought, well, maybe I could actually go back to using the Europeans to keep my power. And I think that's, that's what did him in. That's I what think did that, him in. Yeah, I, I think not, that's exactly what the, he counted on that and it didn't come. But, his, uh, but yeah, his March 1920. Which, right, but that same scenario, you flip it around from the Congress's point of view, that tells you how serious a broad spectrum of politicians in Syria at that moment were about a founding about founding a democratic style government, right? That's and they, right. they stood on, uh, you know, keeping that Congress open and on finishing the drafting of that constitution despite all the threats that came from Europe and uh, the uh, attempts to interfere by Faisal and they finished writing it, right? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I was influenced particularly, there's a professor here in town in Washington named Nathan Brown over at George Washington right. University. Yeah. He wrote a nice little article after, um, you know, well, it was before the Iraq war was over, but he was commenting on um, the, the weakness of the constitutional regime that uh, was put in place after the American invasion. Yeah. And, you know, and he wrote, you know, you can't, constitutions are durable. They're not real unless they are the product of a real give and take, the process of bargaining between opposing parties. Right. You know, and he pointed to the uh, Constitutional Congress at Philadelphia in 1787, where right. you had the Federalists, you know, and their yeah, opponent, yeah, exactly. and you finally agree and you sign on the dotted line. Right, the kind of constitutions that in you know the late 20th century, our technocratic view of politics produced, where you just write some a text and impose it on a people, are not durable. Right, but that's, that's the good. ones, and so I took care and devoted a whole chapter in the book to showing how these opposing parties stuck to it. You know, over the course of about 10 weeks. Um, you know, the, they hammered out a 147 article constitution with a full right. bill of rights. And most importantly, may I point out for, um, I think it will surprise many um, today, that uh, the Arabs at Damascus disestablished Islam as an official religion of state eight years exactly. before Mustafa Kemal Ataturk did it, but they did it with the consent of religious leaders. That's that correct. is a game changer, That's right? right. And, I mean, and, the Turks used to keep And, and Rashid Reda was the was the leader at the time, uh, exactly. and and making exactly. that compromise to uh, to make uh, the Islam the religion of the ruler, not necessarily the religion of the state. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, you know, Rashid Reda's role was uh, was instrumental in in all of this because you know, in in uh, in uh, enacting that constitution, he kept insisting, okay, repeat this. Let's read this again. Let's uh, redo this. And he was very, very influential in, in that whole process. Yes. He and a whole group of people. I mean, he right. was yeah, part sure. of something yeah. called the Syrian Union Party that had formed right. in Cairo in exile. Right. And I think they wrote the first draft of the Constitution. That's and correct. Yeah. Uh, another Syrian politician, uh, Abdurrahman Shahbander. Was yeah, Shahbander was yeah, the foreign minister, yeah. Yeah. And he, uh, well, he was foreign minister, uh, yeah, foreign minister, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, he would be Syria's leading liberal constitutionalist for the next two decades, opposing That's the first mandate, right? right? He, yes. he was one of the leaders of the great 1925 revolt, right? right. right. Um, but by the 1930s, it was impossible to think about democracy as something that could be Islamic. The, the two sides had split. And so that's the, my next project is to explore uh, the split between liberals and religious leaders um, and how that um, undermined future attempts to establish what we might call a, a popular 
democratic regime, right? Yeah, um, I, I, I look forward to, the, to reading that uh, because uh, I, I like it when you, when you make sure that, to point out that Rashid Rida was not necessarily really, did not necessarily endorse uh, uh, Hassan al-Banna's uh, Muslim Brotherhood ideology. I don't think uh, so. he, he did not, and uh, Hassan al-Banna kept referring to him, but no, that's not what Rashid Rida wanted. Yes. No, I mean, what seems anathema to uh, I Islamic uh, politicians, you know, today, is that Rida firmly believed there was a boundary to the jurisdiction of Islamic law, and right. that there were issues of public interest that had to be addressed outside of the confines of that law by an elected assembly. You know, uh, he, he right. believed very firmly in religious law and where it had jurisdiction, no doubt. And he was a conservative right. man. He was not, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. a radical by any stretch. But what Banna did was to do away with those boundaries That's and correct, yeah. argue that all public life had to be ruled by uh, Islamic law so that even the Syrian constitution of 1950 stated right, yeah. right that uh, that uh, legislation should be based on the Sharia. That's correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, listen. I. Uh, oh my God. We really went over time. Uh, I truly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for, for first of all for writing this book. For uh, I, I tell you, I learned so much from it. I truly appreciate your effort. Uh, thank you for joining me today for uh, for answering these questions, and uh, I think we we get ourselves some really very nice uh, answers, very nice conversation going. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, and thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.